to be with you this morning in the house of the Lord. It is time to worship Him, and we are ready. Can I hear an amen? Hallelujah. Let's turn our eyes to Him and our attention to Him today. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we are here for you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your holy presence. Lord, pour out your Spirit on us today and come and have your way. We rest in who you are. We trust.
Welcome to the first Sunday of 2024. It is here, and I want to read a verse today as we jump into worship. It's found in Isaiah chapter 43, and it says, Do not remember the former things. For some of you, that's, hey, do, do not remember all the stuff that happened in 2023. And then it says this, Nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Can I hear an amen on that one? Behold, I will do a new thing. Turn to the person next to you and say, he's going to do something new, okay? He's going to do something new in your life. Say, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. It's going to be a surprise. There's going to be surprises. There's going to be good surprises. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness, and I will make rivers in the desert. He's going to do impossible things. He's going to be do good things for you, and you can expect good things in this new year. Amen. God, we just welcome you here today. God, we come to worship you, to lift you up, Lord, as we move in to 2024. We put our focus on you. We put our eyes on you. You are our everything. We look to you today, God. You make all things new in our lives. You're the God of new starts, of fresh starts. We put this new year in your hands in the name of Jesus.
continue to sing this chorus just a couple more times. I want to invite you to lift your hands in this place this morning. You know, we can worship the Lord in many different ways. My heart's cries to be able to worship the Lord when I stand in front of a sink filled with dirty dishes and just give him all the glory and all the praise. We can worship him in a million different ways, but right now in this time of corporate worship, I'd like to invite you to lift your hands in this place. There's something that happens when we adjust our posture to worship the Lord. There's something that takes place when we readjust our posture and say, Father, here I am, a ready and willing vessel. It is great to see you. A couple things before we get into the message today. We've got, you got this on your way in. If not, you can get on your way out. River City Church Starting Point. If you're new to the church or you just have never been to Starting Point, this is for you. I'll be taking the time to talk to you about the DNA of the church, history of the church. Um, I'm going to talk to you about, my wife and I will be there. We'll talk about how we got here, what is our vision, how we operate. And so we'd love to have you part of that if you've never done a starting point. Also, if you want to serve or you want to be a member at the church, this is the first step for you. And you can scan the QR code there and um, register because we're going to have a light dinner that night. So we want to invite you to be here. That's Tuesday night here in the Life Center, which just is across the parking lot there. We've got all of our classes coming up. We'll be launching for the new year. We have River City School of the Bible, which River City School of the Bible is more of a verse-by-verse study. Um, And we've got one of the cool things this year is we have a class every night, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night. So if Wednesday night works best for you, Thursday night, Tuesday, whatever works best, you can jump into a class. And we have what's called, we're calling it the satanic spirit. We're going to be looking at Satan. We're going to be looking about how he works. And we're going to be talking about how to bring him down and how he is defeated. And so you can be part of that. That's Wednesday night. And then Thursday, we have um, Romans that will be at the Galt campus. So if you want to go to the Romans class, you can do that here on Tuesday nights. We'll be launching our family night again. So, of course, we have youth. And by the way, our youth has just been thriving. Thank you, Pastor Jamie Pierce, for your leadership. And um, just 
what an incredible ministry that has been, and that will continue. Also, kids will be launching, and we have a men's and a women's Bible study. So I want to take a second to talk to you about each. The ladies, you have a great Bible study. It's called Looking for Lovely. It's talking about when you're walking through different seasons in life, looking for the little things that God brings to you. And I want to invite you to turn your attention to the video. A couple of years ago, I found myself in this place of breakdown where everything seemed to have fallen apart. And, and it was a familiar feeling. I'd felt it before, but before I kind of walked away and gone, I don't want to deal with this pain. And I felt like this was a different opportunity. I felt like God was kind of offering this opportunity for me to like step into it and not give up, to persevere through the pain, to see what was on the other side. And I wanted to do that. So I wrote this new book, Looking for Lovely, because I kind of wanted to trace that story and trace that path that I was on. I started to realize that if I wanted to get to the breakthrough from the breakdown, I had to find reasons to not give up along the way. And those were these little lovely moments, these little things as simple as like sushi, to time with my friends, to a sunrise, all these little lovely moments that I really held onto and gripped onto to help me finish help me get to the other side. I wrote Looking for Lovely for you, for my friends, for, for people I've seen walking through hard times, whether it's stuff that you've chosen because of discipline or wanting to have a different life or a different city, or whether something has happened to you like a tragedy and you are feeling pain or heartache and you wanna to get to the other side. I get that, I was there too. Looking for Lovely is not just a book to me. It's the story of the greatest transformation my life has ever known. And I want that for you too. Bible study, and if you scan that QR code, you can order your book. If you'd like to just attend and not order a book, you can do that also. Ladies will be meeting in the Life Center across the parking lot. Men also will be doing a study called Daniel, How to Be a Faithful Man in a Secular World. And if you'll watch that screen again. I am a fighter. A lot of men I know have a question of what does it mean to be faithful to God in a place where God's authority is not recognized. In fact, not only not recognized, but often mocked and despised. The book of Daniel is a book unlike any other in the Bible. You see, it's actually the only Old Testament book not written in the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language, of course, is the language of Israel, but Daniel, the book of Daniel is written in Aramaic, which was the language of Babylon. And the question that the book of Daniel presents is, hey, you know how to be faithful to God in the Hebrew context. Do you know how to be faithful to God in the Aramaic ones? The book of Daniel is a kind of how-to manual. And as a guy, that's what I like. I like how-to manuals of how to not only survive in a context like that, but how to do business there, how to thrive there. I am a fighter. Will you join us in these eight sessions as we go through this incredible book where we discover what it means for us to be faithful in the fire? Then you can scan that QR code and you can order that book, or if you'd like to just come and then order the book at a later date, you can also do that. So a lot of great stuff coming up. Men, we will be meeting in a new location, which is the left, right side of the Lions building, okay? Not where the Life Center is, but their side. They're letting us use their conference room. And so the guys will be meeting over, over there. It's going to be a great um, family month. And you can grab these books. I gave everyone a book, okay? This is the book of John. It's called the Life Book. Um, it's a book. All of you are younger. I'm here today. You can't swipe on it, okay? Nothing will happen if you swipe. It's what we call a book. You got to open it up, okay? And then there's page numbers in it. And you can turn to page 28, and, um, and we're going we're gonna to be there today as we begin our month. We're calling it the Month of Miracles. And I'm believing, I, I'm not only am I going to talk about miracles, we'll be in this book the, all four weeks, and so you can keep bringing it back with you. And I want to invite you to mark it up, write in it, circle things, highlight, just like tear this thing apart, jumping into it, all right? It's going to give you a good start to your year. If you don't have one of these books, you can go in the back, and there are some piles of them. But this is the month of miracles, and not only am I going to talk about the miracles, there's seven of them in, in John, we'll talk about four of them. Not only are we going to talk about them, but I am believing for miracles. I'm believing that God will do a miracle in your life. And some of you come here today and you need God to do something. I believe that God's going to show up and he's going to do it. The works of God are not just words. Listen to me. 
in an ancient manuscript. But God is alive, and God is well, and God is working in our lives. Can I hear an amen? amen. So I believe not only are we going to talk about the miracles, but it's going to be fo- followed by signs and wonders, and we're going to see God do, do miracles in our lives. So what is, start with this, what is a miracle? If you'll hit that next slide for me. What is a miracle? Well, the theological definition of a miracle is this, an extraordinary event taken as a sign of the supernatural power of God. So that is the theological definition of what a miracle is. Now I'm going to give you my definition the way I look at it. So when God created the world, God put things in motion. He created and he put things in motion. For example, gravity. He put gravity in place. He, we, I, I think, you know, you look at the ocean, the, the waves and stuff. God isn't saying there, oh, sitting there saying, oh, this wave happened right now, this wave happened right now. He set those things into motion because of gravity, natural laws that he put in, in place. God isn't out there saying cold wind blow from the north and make everybody in Elk Grove freezing right now. He's not saying that. Um, he put things in motion that caused that to happen. It's the same with your life, okay? You can't leave here today and go get in your car and get going 90 miles an hour and run into a tree and blame God. You made the choice to get in the car you made the choice to go that speed, and you made the choice to run into the car. So things are in motion. Things are happening in our, in our world. Now, this is, this is where I, I see a miracle. There are times that we pray, and God intervenes. Do you hear me today? There are times in our lives. There's times in our lives we'll pray something, and I don't, I don't understand it all. Don't come to me saying, help me understand a miracle. I do not understand miracles, okay? What I do know is there are times that we pray and God intervenes in our life. God intervenes in our world and God changes things. And some of you, you come here today and you need a miracle. I believe that God can and will intervene in your life. It's called faith. It's called believing. And so, so I believe that this is going to be a month that God intervenes in things in your life. It's going to be the month of miracles. Now, we're going to do a few things. We're going to talk about miracles then we're going to pray for miracles, and then we're going to be persistent. We're going to persist for, for miracles. So we're going to talk about them as we look at the book. We're going to pray for them every Sunday. You'll come forward. We'll pray for any miracle that you need in your life. And then we're going to persist. On January 23rd, it's a Wednesday night. We're going to, do, we're going to be doing this monthly. We're calling it a prayer room. And it's the time for you to come here and to persist for a miracle. If you need a miracle in your life, we're going to believe that God's going to do it. You can come, and we're going to pray through those miracles with you. Reverend Tim Sipes over there, if you'll, if you'll wave at everybody, we can see your handsome face there, all right? He's going to be leading that night, and you can come, and we're just going to, sometimes you come to the altar, and we pray for you, and you move on, but sometimes you just need people to surround you and persist for your miracle. So we'll be doing those, those three things. So the month of miracles, you can turn with me to page 28 today of that book. It's on the bottom left there. If you're in the book of John, if you have your Bible, it is John chapter 4. I've entitled this message, The Parallel Miracle. The Parallel Miracle. This is a really cool miracle. It's a story of a, of a dad whose son is sick. He's ill. He's on the verge of death. And this, this dad hears about Jesus. So he, he goes to Jesus on behalf of his son. And Jesus speaks um, a word of healing and that son is healed from, from a distance. It's a really cool miracle, and I call it the parallel miracle because I, I, as I read this miracle, I really think it has a lot of parallels to our lives today. A lot of times you'll look at uh, miracles in the Bible, and you're like, okay, they, Jesus came. He was walking down the road. They went to him. They fell at his feet, and he healed them. I don't have Jesus walking down a road to run to. How does this work in my life? This miracle has a lot of parallels to today and how a miracle would logistically work in your, in your life and how they play out in the life of believers in the 21st century. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through this, this pretty short story, and I'm going to stop, I believe, five times, and we're going to look at the parallel between that miracle and miracles in your life, and we're going to believe that God's going to then show up and he's beginning to work in your life, all right? So to to the story of the miracle, page 28, there on the bottom, it says, Jesus heals an official's son. First two words there, and then we'll stop. So he, so he, who is the miracle um, talking about? Who's the story talking about? Who really is the center of the story? It is Jesus. Jesus is the center of the story. So, so Jesus, he is the first part of the story. Now, 
Um, I want us to take a minute to think about what these people knew about Jesus at this time. I want us to reflect upon especially the book of John and the scene that has been set for Jesus. Now, when we read um, and we know about Jesus, we've read the story from beginning to end, from his birth to his death and his resurrection. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that we can read and pull on. We hear about him. We talk about him. But these people in this moment, in the first century, what did they understand for, about Jesus, especially in the book of John, what did they understand through the lenses of John? Well, if you turn to John chapter 1, you get the first sighting of Jesus. He's 30 years old, and we read about it here in the book of John. He's walking in the wilderness, and his crazy cousin John. How many have a, cu- a crazy cousin, all right? Everyone's got a crazy cousin. His crazy cousin John, how do I know he's crazy? Because he w- wore camel hair and ate locusts. Okay, so he's a crazy, like, he's an evangelist. Evangelists are a little crazy anyway, all right? So he's, like, out, and he's evangelizing people, and he's pointing them towards Jesus. And Jesus comes walking through the wilderness. He's 30 years old. He's the son of a carpenter. He is a carpenter. And crazy cousin John starts pointing at Jesus to saying, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the first picture of Jesus in the book of John. Then it gets even a little crazier. He goes, and he gets a few more disciples. And and in chapter 2, if you look at chapter 2, he shows up in Cana of Galilee. Cana of Galilee, and he's, he's there for a wedding with his, with his mom, Mary, and they run out of wine. And so Mary goes to Jesus and says, hey, I need you to do a miracle and turn this turn, and, and make some more wine. And I ask myself, why would she ask him? How did she even know? If this was his first miracle, how did she even know? Well, if you read some extra biblical sources, um, there's some weird stories. Probably none of them are true. Maybe some of them are. Matter of fact, I didn't, I didn't say this first service, but let's have some fun, okay? Um, there's a story in one of the extra biblical sources that Jesus, as a little boy, made took mud and made pigeons and threw them up, and they flew away. And so there's some strange stories out there. Who knows what Mary saw is my point. And so she looks at Jesus, and she's like, this guy I saw make the pigeons and throw them and then fly away. He can do this. And she says, Jesus, I want you to make some more wine. Jesus is like, no, I'm not doing it. He finally gives in and he turns water into wine. So the guy who's walking in the desert and his crazy cousin is yelling, this is the lamb of God, is now making water into into wine in Cana of Galilee. The next scene you get is even crazier. Jesus walks into the temple and there's tables set up, people selling sacrifices. Doesn't sound like a big deal to us. It was a big deal to them because then they had to pay and they were, causing, they were charging huge fees. They had to pay in order to go and to sacrifice and to, and, to, and to go to the temple. And so Jesus didn't like this. So he starts turning over tables and yelling at everybody. And he says this, he says, this is my father's house and you've made it into a den of thieves this is my father's so what is he claiming now that he's the son of god okay this is interesting stuff jesus is really he's really stirring things up isn't he i'm the son of god this is my father's house and you're turning it into a den of thieves then he goes and he preaches this crazy sermon and nicodemus is there and he says listen if you're gonna enter in the kingdom of god you've got to be born again Now, Nicodemus, we go, born again, of course, that means saved. That didn't mean to them. Nicodemus said, I'm an old man. How would I go back into my mother's birth canal and be born again? He says, well, you got to be born again. You got to be born again, right? And it's of the spirit, and it's of water, and and it's a different kind of born again. So this is Jesus. This is what they're getting of Jesus. Then we go into the next chapter, chapter three, and Jesus goes to Samaria to a place he shouldn't be as a Jew to talk to somebody he shouldn't be talking to as a Jew, a woman at a well, and he goes and he argues with her about temple protocol. And she ends up saying, wow, this is the true prophet. And she goes back and she, she witnesses. And so, so this is the Jesus we're, we're talking about. It's not the big picture that we see today. What does this tell me about Jesus? It tells me this. Jesus was disruptive. And Jesus was divisive. And when Jesus, someone hear me today, when Jesus showed up, it wasn't business as usual in your life. He changed everything. Now, I want you to hear me. The pagan people, they, they did not understand. They did not get Jesus. It did, Jesus did not make sense to the pagan. Jesus also did not make sense to, to the religious. He was beyond their comprehension. And they all had a choice. Are we going to receive or are we going to reject this Jesus? Now we go to the parallel, okay? The parallel for us today. Okay, when Jesus shows up, all of us sitting here today that know Jesus, when he shows up, it disrupts your life. It is no longer business as usual when Jesus shows up. 
The other thing about Jesus, let me tell you what, he is beyond comprehension. When he shows up in your life, you're not going to, anyone here, you've ever been like you're following the Lord and God says, hey, I want you to give to this or I want you to do that. You're like, that doesn't make sense. Friends, listen, a life serving Jesus doesn't always make sense. Come on, can I hear an amen today? Don't think that it's all going to add up. You can't add Jesus up. You can't put him in a nice little tight box. He cannot be comprehended. And when you walk with Jesus, you walk hand. Oh, I made, a, I made this rhyme for service. I'm going to see if I can do it again. When you walk with Jesus, you walk hand in hand with a man you just don't understand. Is that good? <laughs> It's like Dr. Seuss, right? But it is so true. When you walk with Jesus, you walk hand in hand with a man you just do not understand. He's beyond your comprehension. Why? His, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And friends, listen, you might sit here today. And I can't figure this all out. He gets the big picture and you do not. You can't understand Jesus because he sees the big tip picture. They only saw a little slice that was crazy. He saw the big picture at that moment. And friends, as you walk with him, he's got the big picture of your life in mind. If it takes that long for two words, we're going to be here all day, okay, on this passage. I'm just kidding. So he, next it says, came again to Cana in Galilee where he had made water to wine. Let's stop for a second and let's again talk about the water to wine. So this is Jesus' first miracle it's in cana at galilee and he goes to this wedding and his mom says hey they're out of wine um you need to make some more and jesus makes some water takes water and he turns it into wine sounds very cute but let me show you exactly what jesus did if you hit that slide for me he took h2o and turned it to c2h6o he changed the molecular structure of that liquid this is, this is a big deal. There's a lot of symbolism here, but let's just talk about the actuality of what people saw at that moment. He turned H2O to C2H6O at that wedding. Why? I, this is a, every time I read this miracle, I always ask myself, why? Like, why would you make this your first miracle? Why did Jesus do this? I, I believe there's, there's several reasons, but I'm gonna give you two. The first reason is this. He was making a statement that he has authority even over the building blocks of life, molecular structure, the DNA, the cells of life. He has authority and he has power over even the building blocks of your life sitting here today. He has power over all things. The second statement he was making is he was doing this. He was building the faith of that community. Why did that guy go to Jesus? Because we read here in the passage Jesus had gone to them, and he, he'd, had, he'd, he'd had a miracle in that area, Cana of Galilee, turned the water into wine. So this guy heard about that miracle, and he said, Jesus is back. Now I need to go for, to him for my miracle. Now everybody in that region, everybody in that, in that area, had, they fit in one or two categories. They even either heard of the miracle or seen the miracle of the turning of water into wine. Like, it spread quickly in the Middle East, like, People, there's people running to communities telling everybody about what Jesus did. So they either, they'd either heard about it or they had seen it. And within that faith community, then they started to have like these rumors that were happening, like gossip was happening. At River City Church, we call it possip, positive gossip, right? So there's positive gossip that is happening. We do positive gossip around here. They're like, hey, like, imagine it in here, like, like, let's say that you're at, um, David, you're, you and Stephanie, you, you go to a prayer meeting and you're praying and God shows up and absolutely heals like your broken leg and you go and you're telling other people and it starts spreading. And before you know it, Tim's over here saying, hey, did you hear about what happened to David and Stephanie? And it just, it's getting around the community. Do you know what it's doing is building faith for the next miracle. Why is it that Jesus turned water into wine? He was building the faith of that community for the next miracle. All right, now let's get to the parallel here, okay? You and me, we are part of a faith community. God, God puts you here at River City Church for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is so that we can be a congregation that builds each other's faith. Yeah. Let, let me tell you why. There's some people here today, and you've seen God do great things. And there's others, you need God to do great things. 
There's some of you guys you've seen and you've heard and you've walked with it and you've walked in it. And there's others and you're like in the category that you've heard, but you have not seen. Friends, 2024, maybe it's the year like God did for this man, this ruler, that he moves you from the heard to the seen category in your life. And you need to be around people that are building your faith, that are pointing you to Jesus. Back to the text, it says this, where he had made water into wine, and at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. So there's an official there whose son is, is ill. This is a different kind of miracle we're seeing here in this book. A lot of times, the miracles you read of Jesus, there are some exceptions, but there's a blind person. Jesus will go to him, touch him, they're healed. There's somebody that's sick, Jesus will touch them, they're healed. Or Jesus will say you're healed, and they will be healed. And this is a different kind of, of miracle because you have a dad that's carrying the burden of a son who needs a miracle on behalf of his son. So what does he do? This, this dad, he goes, goes to Jesus on behalf of his, of his child, all right, to the parallel. This, this dad, he's carrying a burden on behalf of his child. Listen, a burden is the birthing place of a miracle in your life. You carrying a burden is the breeding ground for God to do something. Don't you wish God could do miracles without there being problems? Don't you wish you could have a testimony without a test? But friends, in your life, when you're carrying a burden, when there's things that are happening, we don't want to put miracles just into like healing. Okay, there's all kinds of miracles that can happen in your life. And they're a result of a burden. And there's people here today and you're carrying a burden over something. It can be an illness. It could be a wayward child. It could be a sick child like this guy here. It could be a financial burden. It could be fill in the blink, but you're carrying a burden. It is the breeding ground for God to do a miracle in your life. Does that mean I should thank God for my problems? I don't know. (laughs) I'm not going to, but we just say we should, right? It's the breeding ground. Your burden, the problem you're facing now is the breeding ground for God to do something in in your life now. This miracle in particular strikes a, um, strikes a chord for me. First of all, because I love my children. Anyone here, you like your kids. Like some of you don't, but you know, you like your kids. You love, and, and I tell you what, I'd much rather be sick than my kid be sick, right? You guys following me. I'd much rather have, have something going on in my life than carry the burden of something going on in my life. So it, it, it strikes a chord for me. My, my grandpa, when he was 93, um, ex, you know, retired missionary and just man of God, and he, his body had pretty much shut down. He didn't have much that he, could, he was living for. He, had, he couldn't hardly walk. He was on um, dialysis. He was very sick all the time. And, and he told me, man, I'm ready to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. But God is keeping me here on earth for one reason, because there's really only one thing I can do, and that is pray for you and pray for my family. I want you to hear me today. Never give up praying for your burden. Never give up praying for your children. Never give up. You could be the one standing between them and hell. Don't give up praying for your children. He brought his child, that burden, to to God. Children here today, we have some people, you don't have kids yet. Hear, Hear me, all of you kids today, you are our greatest burden And our greatest burden is that you experience God at a higher level and a greater level than we ever did. We want you to experience Jesus. So we pick you up. You say, I don't want to go to church today. We're picking you up and we're taking you and setting you at the feet of Jesus. There's some young people here today. I know you. I know you're here. And your parents are not in church and your parents don't have anything to do with church. This is your faith family. And we today, we bring you to the feet of Jesus. You need Jesus in your life. You are our greatest, our greatest burden. Back to our text. We're going to read a little more here. It says, when this man heard that Jesus had come to Judea and Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my son dies. This guy, this official, he goes to Jesus. This official, his name in the, um, his title in the Greek was Basilikos. So he was a Basilikos. What was a Basilikos? A Basilikos was an officer in the court of King Herod. So he was a Basilikos. He was an officer in the court of King Herod. As an officer, he would have had 
all authority. He would have had the availability to have any doctor he needed. So all the doctors in the area, all the doctors in the region would have been at his disposal. He also would have had all the money that he needed. So he had all the resources, all the medicines, everything that he could want for his son's illness he had. And with all that he had, he still ran to the end of his abilities. And he turns to Jesus. This Basilicos also, he was... um, he was a man that worked in the, in the courts of King Herod. Now, anyone here that knows your Bible, you would know King Herod just didn't get along with Jesus. Matter of fact, he saw Jesus as a big threat, didn't he? So we have this guy. Jesus is now emerging on the scene. He's done this miracle. Word has obviously gotten around this region. This guy works in the, the courts of King Herod. He would have heard about Jesus. Why did he end up at that spot where Jesus was? Because he heard about Jesus. They were tracking Jesus, not for good reasons. Because they looked at Jesus and said, this is a false Messiah. This is the carpenter's son. This is not the Messiah that has been prophesied. So he's got all of these things happening. Can you imagine the tension that this Basilicos had at that time? Pulling him in two directions. Should I go to Jesus or not? My son is dying yet. I don't know. This is that guy, that crazy guy. is John the Baptist running around saying he's the Lamb of God. What should I do? The tension he must have faced that we all face in, in our life as he, as he went, to, went to Jesus. As he went to Jesus that day, um, Jesus said something to him. He said, said, listen, after he said, will you heal my son? He said, some will only believe by signs and wonders. I look at that and I say, why would you say this to this dude? He's a basilicos, right? He's had to leave Herod's court. I mean, this guy's gone. He's traveled to where you're at. I'd say he's had a lot of faith in his life to go to you, Jesus. That's the way I read it. So why would he say this? Well, I don't think personally Jesus was even speaking to that man at that moment. We don't have the hand motion. So he's got this guy standing in front of him, the basilicos, and he's had this great faith and he's come to Jesus on behalf of his son. And Jesus says, listen, listen, all of you, we don't see where Jesus is pointing. Listen, You won't believe unless you see signs and wonders. Fill in the blanks. This guy right here, he's come without even seeing the signs and wonders. He was a person of faith with that tension in his life. He chose to follow Jesus. What is the parallel here? The parallel for our lives. A lot has changed in 2,000 years, but this has not changed. Jesus is the only answer, friends. I don't care what resources you bring to the table. I don't care what doctors you have at your accessibility. I don't care what planning you do. I don't care what books you read. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care what century you live in. Jesus is the only answer, and we need Jesus, amen? We need him in our lives. Come on, let's give him praise today. He is the answer. He is the answer. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you bring to the table. There's a few things, I want to do a minute of teaching here. There's a few things we learned from this basilicos, from this story so thus far. If you hit the next slide. First of all, as he comes to Jesus, as you come to Jesus with your burden, he came with humility. I'm a basilicos. He's a carpenter. Yet I'm going to humble myself because I don't have what it takes to answer my question and I'm gonna, my problem. And I'm going to come to the carpenter. I'm going to come to Jesus. There was humility that had to happen in this Basilicos' life for him to come to Jesus. The other thing we see is a persistence. Jesus says, says, hey, listen, you're not going to see without signs and wonders. And again, the guy says, yeah, who cares about all of them, though? I just need you to heal my son. There was a persistence that happened when he came to Jesus. It is okay to go to Jesus over and over and over and over. I hate it when my kids come to me over and over and over and over again. But somehow our Father God, he loves to hear from you over and over and over and over. And I don't know why he doesn't answer at times the way we think he should answer. I don't know why things don't look the way they look. But I know this, we're called to go to Jesus persistently for our needs. Why? I, part of it is the process Like, God is way more concerned about who you are than how things turn out for you. He's working on the inside, and he wants you to have a heart that's seeking after him with persistence over. Some people, you've got a burden that you've been carrying for a long time. You've gone to Jesus a thousand times. Today, maybe it'll be a thousand and one times, but who knows? Maybe you're one time away from breakthrough, amen? There was a persistence that happened. There was a faith. This guy went to Jesus, and he asked him to do something, and Jesus said, your son is healed. And he walks away going back to his son without any proof that his son had been healed. There was a faith that happened in this guy's, in this guy's life. So he, he went to him with humility and persistence and faith. Back to our, our text today. 
And Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servant met him, oh, this is so cool, and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them, by the way, I, I'm, I'm in the book, right? This is a book. We're in a book because I want you to learn also how to read your Bible. You can look at this. You can see how, how I stop and I'm getting things from it. When you read your Bible, it's not just a novel. It's not just something you read through. You need to stop. You need to allow the Lord to speak to you, which is what the Lord did to me, which is what you're hearing today. And you can do this for you. You can do this in your life. You need to learn how to do this. So Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked him the hour when he had begun to get better. Let's get down to brass tacks here. When exactly did this happen? He said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And the father knew that it was the exact hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. Your son will live. What? How cool is that? The same exact hour. Now, Capernaum was 20 to 25 miles away from, the, from, Gal, from Cana and Galilee where Jesus was. So this guy left his sick son and walked 25 miles to get to, to, get to Jesus. Now, the typical miracle of the day, like we talked about, there would have been contact. He would have had to bring him. The son would have come there. But Jesus didn't say, hey, that's fine, but you better get your son and bring him to me. Do you know what Jesus did? He broke the mold. He threw out the formula. Why? Because he cared about the kid more than he cared about any formula. I want you to hear this when it comes to miracles. We like to formalize them. Say, oh, you do this, you do that, you do this. You, you. No, 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 no. You just come to Jesus. That's the only thing we know. You come to Jesus, there's no formula, there's no right way, there's no wrong way. It's just Jesus and it's you. And Jesus breaks the formula here from 20, 25 miles away. He heals, he heals this, this kid. The first miracle, worship team, you can come on up. The first miracle we read about, Jesus was declaring that he had authority over even the building blocks of life. He had authority over, over DNA and molecules. The second the second miracle is cool because Jesus also proclaims something, and it's this, that Jesus has authority over time and space. He is not limited by time, and he is not limited by space. 20 miles did not make a difference to Jesus. He was able to do a miracle from a distance because he has power over time and space. The parallel for our life today, we live 2,000 years later than Jesus. He's not standing here in physical form like he used to, but Jesus has the power to work a miracle in your situation today. He has power over time and space. Let, let me tell you how we'll, we'll be done here. Let me tell you how I, I, I found this out in a very dramatic way. I was 17 years old and I, um, I'd seen God do things in people's lives. Still, you're kind of like, did Jesus just heal them or did their headache go away? You know the miracles I'm talking about, right? You're like, eh, I don't know. So I was in Brazil with my dad. My dad was raised in Brazil, so I went back with him. Um, it was kind of a graduation gift, and we went to the churches my grandpa started. He walked me through neighborhoods he was raised in. Um, the, the, the last night I was there, we were in Rio de Janeiro, and I was asleep in a hotel room, and I had this horrible dream. And I don't have, like, real dramatic dreams, but I had a dramatic dream, a horrible dream. There was a lady I worked with um, at a restaurant back in Oakdale, and she was, like, five months pregnant. And... And I had a dream, like very vivid, of her miscarrying the baby. And they're crying, and the baby's coming out. It was really a graphic, horrible dream. And I woke up. It was the middle of the night there in Brazil, a different time zone. And I woke up, and this is the first time this happened to me. I felt God say he was waking me up to pray for her. So I started praying for her, and I prayed for a little while and more and more because I had a burden. Remember the burden part? It's the breeding ground. I had a burden, so I prayed through that burden, and then it lifted couple days later we're home and I'm I come in um, to the airport my brother's there and he says did you hear what happened to this lady that I worked with I go no and she he goes two days ago um, she almost miscarried her baby and he told me that she was had gone to the hospital he told me the time and I did exactly what this dad started doing I calculated I made the time difference because they were six hours ahead in Brazil did all the calculations guess what at the very moment that she was about to miscarry that baby and take it to the hospital in Brazil by the way I'm the only Christian in this lady's life in Brazil God's waking me up with a burden to pray for her. I prayed through it, and that baby survived. She ends up on bed rest. That baby is born. Now, that's, this is the cool part, okay? I go home. Of course, she's on bed rest. I don't see her for like six months. She comes back to work after the baby's born. I go up to her, and I tell her the story. 
And she starts crying and her and her husband give their lives to Jesus because of that testimony, all right? That little girl, her name is Michaela. She ended up, um, I, I went away to college after that, came back to that community as a youth pastor. She ended up a junior higher and high schooler in my youth ministry. Friends, listen, he has authority over time and space. And you may limit God and say, yeah, I'm carrying this burden. I've been carrying it for a long time. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's a kid. You fill in the blank. But I don't know if Jesus can. He can. He has power over every molecule. And he has power over time and space. The last thing, and then we're going we're to be done. The last phrase here, it says this. And he himself believed in all his household. The father's faith brought a miracle to the entire household. Somebody comprehend that today. The father's faith brought a miracle to the entire. I, I don't know if you've ever heard the statistic, but statistically, if a man follows the Lord, you're the first convert in the family, the man, the husband, that 93% of the time, the rest of the family will follow in that decision. Listen, you men, you set the stage for miracles in your life and in your children. You have a role. But all of you, my call today, if you'll stand with me as we prepare to close. The whole heart of this miracle, the parallel miracle, okay? What is parallel? You can throw away all the other stuff I said. It's about this. It's this one thing. It's parallel. Bring it to Jesus. Take it to Jesus. Take it to Jesus. There's no formula. That you have a burden today. Your burden. Come to me, all of you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We don't understand a lot about miracles, but I do know that God intervenes at times. God intervenes, and what I do know is that we're called to take it to Jesus. So if you'll close your eyes right now all across this place, take it to Jesus. I don't know what you're facing right now. I don't know what you're dealing with, but the answer is, I know the answer, take it to Jesus. Take it to Jesus. Take it to Jesus. Come on, we're just going to do that right now all over this place, all over this place. If you have a burden you're carrying, you need to take it to Jesus today. We just lift your hands in front of you and say, Jesus, here I am. I take it to you. Come on, it could be anything. The burden, the burden is the breeding ground. The burden is the breeding ground for the miracles of Jesus. Come on, your burden right now, you don't want it. Sure, it's a problem. You don't like it, but it's the breeding ground. It's setting you up. Setting you up. Come on. Setting you up for a miracle in your life. Come on, say, here I am, Jesus. Here I am, Jesus. I, I take it to you. I take it to you. I bring it to you. I bring it to you. Jesus, I bring it to you. I bring it to you. Come on, I said we're going to follow by signs and wonders right now. Come on, you and Jesus. Just say, I bring it to you, Jesus. I bring it to you. I don't know what to do with it. I don't. It doesn't fit the norm. It doesn't make sense what I'm doing, but I just bring it to you. Bring it to you, Jesus. I bring it to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just get in the presence of God right now. Sure, he'll disrupt your life. Sure, it's no longer business as normal. But I tell you, you're holding hands with the one you cannot comprehend right now. The one you cannot understand. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Come on, I'm going to invite you. Bring it to Jesus. Our altars are open now. If you need a miracle right now, I'm going to invite you to come forward to the altar. Just like that man went to Jesus. He went to him. I'm going to invite you to step out. Come to the altar right now. Just you and Jesus. Come on. You're stepping out. It's a step of faith. Just like he walked the Basilicus walk the 20 miles. Come on. When you take that step, you're stepping out. You're stepping out right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. As we do this song, I'm going to invite you to come to the altar. So you can continue to come, and we're going to pray for you. A few people are going to help me. We're going to ask for God to do that miracle. As you bring that burden to Jesus this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
There is power in you. 
your first time with us and you're our first time guest, you can take this out of the front of your seat. You can scan it. We'd love to get your connection, especially on our text thread. We'd love to be able to connect with you. Um, thank you for your faithful giving throughout 2023. Giving stations are on the walls. They give you boxes. Giving station in the back. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. 